did. I will tell you that what we're going to talk about today is one of those things that is heavy on my heart, so I might go a little bit long. So that's my full disclosure. So the sooner we start, the better, because I know that kids kind of kind of roam up here at about 1140, 1145-ish. You ready? All right, can we stand up for prayer? Now, if you guys remember, we made a deal. It would not be me reading all by myself. So um, I encourage all of you guys that we've got the right slideshow up now, and it's nice and big, and all of you guys should be able to read it from where you are. If you cannot, move forward, and then um, hopefully we can, we can read it together so we can all pray in one voice. So in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of one God, amen. Let us, give us, let us give thanks to beneficent and merciful God, the Father of our Lord. Helped us, guarded us, accepted us to himself, buried us, supported us, and brought us to this power. Let us also ask him, the Lord, our God, the Pontificator, to guard us in all peace. Father of our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, concerning everything and in everything, you have covered us, helped us, guarded us, accepted us into yourself, bear to support us, and has brought us to this hour. Ask and entreat your goodness, O love of mankind, to grant us complete this holy day and all the days of our life to those who seek you. All envy, all temptation, all the work of Satan, the counsel of wicked men, and the rising up of enemies to be none of us. Take them away from us and from all your people and from this holy place that is yours. But those things which are good and profitable do provide for us. For it is you who have given us the authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and upon all the power of the enemy. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through the grace, compassion, and love of mankind of your only begotten Son, our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, through whom the glory of the honor of the dominion and worship are adjourned to you, with him and the Holy Spirit and the giver of life, who is one essence with you, now at all times and to the ages of all ages. Amen. Have mercy upon me, O God. According to the multitudes of your crime, blot out my iniquities. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I'm conscious of my iniquity, and my sin is at all times before me. Against you only have I sinned and done evil before you, that you might be known from your saying, and I overcome when you are judged. For behold, I was conceived in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. For behold, you have loved the truth. You shall sprinkle me with hyssop, and I shall be purified. You shall wash me, and I shall be made whiter than snow. Make me. Turn away your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in my inward parts. Do not cast me away from your face, and do not remove your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of salvation, and uphold me with a directing spirit. Then I shall teach the transgressors your ways, and the ungodly man shall turn to you. Deliver me, O God, the God of my salvation. And my tongue shall run the God of my My lips and my mouth shall declare your praise. And for you, if you desire sacrifice, I would have given it. Do not take the pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and humbled heart God shall not despise. Do good, O Lord, in your pleasure to Zion. And let the walls of Jerusalem be built. Then you should be pleased with sacrifice. <coughs> Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity uh, that we may come into your presence again. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. You have provided all good things. We ask that some way you have provided my soul. We ask that some way you provide our souls as we pray. I ask that you fill us with joy this afternoon, Lord. I ask that this message that is given, it is your message, Lord, to give it to your people. I ask that you rest it with hearts, Lord, that this is something that we can actually take. I ask that you give us specific points, Lord, things that you want us to do, how you want us to live out this message, Lord, that this is not something that's just pleasing to ears, Lord. It's actually something that's lifted up to you as a sacrifice, Lord. I ask this, that you have mercy on us, Lord, that you forgive me my many sins, Lord, that you forgive all of my sins. If we pray one voice, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For Christ is our Lord, and is the only Son of God. Test, test, test. Let me 
and trust me, make sure we get you. All right, I'm just going to keep talking while Claudio adjusts the timing, and hopefully he can get, or not the timing, but the sound, that hopefully we can get that right. So it does not, I don't know, I do not sound loud. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he's working on it. So he's, he's playing with the adjustments as we speak. So can you guys hear me now? Is that a little bit better? No, not at all. I can also yell. I have no problem yelling. But I think once we start getting too loud, we're going to start getting some feedback. And sometimes it helps if I go like this. And sometimes if we remove that, although that is off. Wait, wait. All right. So, OK, well, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll start while he can. OK, it's better? OK, cool. So um, does anyone remember what we talked about last week? The light, right? Light coming in the darkness. And I remember I told you guys I felt like I had another week of like, like the nativity in me. And I will just tell you guys that I lied because um, does anyone, did, it, did anyone, what, what was the gospel today? Yeah, it was Luke, right? And, but there was a specific theme. Abuna talked about it a lot. A lot. It says, you know, no one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but under a lampstand that all those who come by might see the light, right? So, and then he starts going on and it was more about the light. And then honestly, even like last week when we were talking about this light, I had this whole thing where I said, you know what? Like, I love the fact that we were talking about the fact that Christ came as the light in the midst of darkness, right? It was really, really dark. And then Christ showed up and he brought all of the light with him. And then I started thinking about, okay, well, what does that look like in our lives, right? Like, it's nice that Christ came and he brought us light, but shouldn't this light show up in different areas of our life? And the two things that specifically came to mind um, that I felt that we could probably use more of this in our life was when it comes to light in our marriages and then the light in our parenting, right? So... Um, Today we're going to talk about marriage, and if you know anything about me, this is one of the things I'm, I'm always on my soapbox about it. This is a special topic. I'm especially passionate about it. If we were honest with, it, with each other, I think that marriage is probably one of those things that as a culture, we don't do great at. And I think it's kind of even sad to say that. And it's sad because a lot of people don't want to acknowledge that. But when you look around culturally, it's very, very true. Um, and I also believe that outside of our relationship with God, the relationship in your marriage is probably one of the, okay, we're gonna be okay? As a, I thought I was about to get really loud. <laughs> but all right, so outside of our relationship with God, marriage is probably the biggest factor like in your happiness. And I say it all of the time and I encourage people, you have to invest in your marriage, you have to build into your marriage. And if you put in the hard work that it takes, you will have a happy marriage, right? And having a happy marriage is like heaven on earth. But if you don't, well, <laughs> you can feel like you're in the other place, right? But it's so important. And I believe that like, if you really wanna be successful at marriage, it's not easy. And, I, and I'll even say even growing up, right? Like I feel like Christina and I had this misconception that when two Christian people got married, their life would automatically be I, I knew it was coming, I was just early, right? <laughs> Maybe that'll work, is that better? I think it'll help. Okay, that's fine, I can get even further. So, it sounds better, does it? Test, 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 okay. So I feel that we had this mis misconception that when two Christian people got married, their lives would automatically be happy and their marriage would automatically work out, right? And I am telling you that if you are not married, right? It's barely not true. There, I got that out, okay? All right, let's, I'll give you a second, Claudio. So go test, test. You want me to try switching mics? All right, we can do that. Let me try this one.
Claudia, I remember you have a preference on which side this is. Do you like this on the left side? All right, can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me? I can't hear myself. Test? All right, cool. Is that better? All right. So what I was basically saying, and I totally forgot where I was in my notes, but yeah, so we have this mis I need to bring it closer. Is that better? Okay. So if you were, no, there's our friend feedback. That's you? Okay. So if you're not married, I'm going to tell you that it's blatantly not true. And there's this one story that it, it always comes to mind. And I remember it was one time Mbabulis from Africa, he was visiting and I was kind of driving him around and, and I was just telling him like, Sayedna, like, dude, your life must be really hard, right? Like you're a bishop, you're living, you're living in like the slums of Africa and, you know, and I've been there and the, the conditions are rough and like, you know, all of this other stuff. And I just remember he told me, he says, Peter, I said, I travel the world and I see all types of people. Right. Like I live with like the poorest of poor people. I go and I visit like the richest of rich people. And I'm going to tell you one thing that no matter what, life is hard. I haven't come across somebody yet that their life wasn't hard. So why not let your life be hard for something that brings the glory of God? Right. And, and I thought about that. And, and it's true. Right. Because life is hard. Right. And one of the reasons your life could be hard is if you're not doing marriage right. So if you're going to do marriage, at least do it in a way that's going to glorify God because it's promised in Matthew 7, and we all know this story. It says that there's two houses and the rain comes and the storm hits and the wind beat down both houses. And I'll confess, I even remember when I was a younger Christian, I always thought that story was completely different. I thought that there were two houses and the storm hit one of the houses. But I remember one time I was reading and I'm like, wait, you meant the, the storm hit both houses? Without a doubt. And I think a lot of the times we think if we're living, you know, doing the best that we can and we're in fellowship with Christ and we're coming to church and we're doing our part, then we think that we're going to be exempt from the storm. But never, right? Like it hit both houses. The difference is what they were built on, right? And we need to build our house on the rock. Psalm 18, 2, it says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Right, and I love that stronghold. I love it because you know I know Christina. The, the, the right, because for our marriage to work, right, we need more light. We need more Christ. That should be where our foundation is. That's where we should go. And I will tell you, um, by the grace of God, Christina, who's here somewhere, there she is. Just uh, we recently, the last one we celebrated was 18 years, and I know that 18 years is not a lot compared to some of you guys in here. But I will even say, even within that 18 years, if we were not Christian, I am pretty sure we would not still be married, because marriage is that hard. And a lot of the times, I think it's the glue that kind of pushes us through. Right. And I think that a part of the fact is that because when marriage is hard and Christ is my rock and my strength and the one that I trust, it gives you the perseverance to kind of push through. If you didn't believe in that, I don't know we would have. I know we wouldn't have gone 18 years. And I remember one of the best um, lines I ever heard during a, a wedding speech was that you have to look for Christ in each other, but you also have to be Christ to each other. And I think if you think about that, like that's, that's really deep and it's a great line and, and I loved it. And I heard that line before I was married, but when I got married and I tried to do it, it was way harder, way harder, right? But we've got to figure this out. So unfortunately, being Christ and bringing light to your spouse is not easy, right? And our marriages started as a promise, a promise to each other that I will always love you. I will always be there. We will be best friends and we'll do this and we'll do all of this other stuff. But I will tell you that don't ever think that your marriage will, per will survive based off of your performance. Never, right? For a, for a marriage to survive, it has to be because of grace. Because marriage requires both parties to be faithful, to be perfect, to honor all of their vows you know, if that's what it was all about, no marriage would survive because we're all sinners and we all screw up. We all sin against our spouses and we all deserve to have been broken up with, right? Every single one of us will always fall short. 
So the marriages that, that go the distance, it's not they go the distance because they're great at their activities or they're great at their works or they're great at you know, all of the things and keeping their promises, even though, yeah, there's, there's a level of importance to that stuff. The great marriages are due because of grace. When you're married to a spouse that can show grace, right? Not promises kept or performance. You need grace. And marriage is like a braid of hair. And I love it in Ecclesiastics where, you know, I'm going to use a little bit of biblical freedom here. But imagine your marriage is like, you know, it's two strands, right? You just, just, just the two of you. Can that be braided? No, it cannot be braided, right? You need the third strand. Or so I'm told. I only have boys. I don't have to braid hair. But for the... <laughs> For people who have daughters, I've been told that it requires three strands, right? Not only with that third strand, can you braid it, it could be tightly woven, but it, all, it could also be strong. And like that is required. It is required that we add Christ into our marriage for that third strand. And his Christ-like characteristics, that's what makes things go further. And I believe when I was thinking about this whole concept of light and I started thinking about, okay, how do we have lights, love, uh, Christ's light in our marriage, and what does that mean to, to our relationships? There was two things that, that I figured if we can put these two things, right, if we had these two things of light in our marriage, it would be completely, completely different. The first one is if we can mimic Christ's love. And that's, I'm going to start off by saying, yes, that's a very, very tall order right? Like if we can mimic Christ's love, and not only does he love well, but he loves without limit. And I know that we all love 1 Corinthians 13, and I'm just going to run through it real fast, where it says, love suffers long and is kind. It does not envy. It does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not speak of its own. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and love never fails. And I know that when we read something like that in 1 Corinthians 13, the first thing we do is we are super sensitive to the fact that we fail miserably when it comes to that. But the beautiful thing is when you look at 1 Corinthians 13, you say, I don't measure up to that. Like, that's not me at all. But we have to find a level of comfort that it is Christ, right? And I will tell you that we might not be able to nail that perfectly, but I guarantee you if we set our eyes on that and we try and we do our best to love the way that Christ loved, our marriages would all look different. And a part of the issue when we start talking about love is the world's love doesn't amount to much these days. When you start thinking about what, what the world tells us love, you know, on any given day, I can love 15 to 20 things, right? Like, you know, I can... I can love where I went to lunch, right? I can love my job. I can love my kids. I can love, you know, my favorite meal. I can love. Right. And, but I will tell you, like, when we start thinking about what the world means when it starts talking about loving something, and we start looking at what the Bible means when it starts talking about loving something, it's completely different because that's not what Christ is talking about. You know, one of my favorite verses, and this might not seem like a love verse to you, but in Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love. And, and I'm going to break this apart a little bit, right? Because walk in love, walk is an action, isn't it? Right? Well, we've always been taught that this love is an emotion, right? But it's basically telling you, like, walk in love. So there's an action part to it, right? And it says, as Christ also loved us and given himself for us. So now you talk about the fact that love is an action, okay? And then he was giving. So it means that you have, you have to give something for it, right? I'm going to tell you, a love without giving is not love. It's cheap, Right? So he's basically saying, walk in love, and Christ also has loved us and given himself for us and offering a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma, right? An offering and a sacrifice. Does your love consist of a sacrifice? And I think that's the part that the world will never understand, right? We have to have an action. There has to be giving, and there has to be a sacrifice. And I think this is an untapped concept in a lot of marriages today because why do i have to sacrifice 
Like that's not an appealing concept for, for, for a lot of people, right? Like I don't mind loving my spouse. I don't mind loving my wife, my husband, and, and I'll do it. But like, why do I have to sacrifice? Why does it going to have to cost me something? Right? And St. Paul basically says, he says, I can see your love by your sacrifice, but I, sh- I challenge you to show me your love without it. And I think that that's one of the things that we really, really get stuck on, right? Like, I will show you I love you, I, I'm, you know, by this and that and all that, but it, if it doesn't cost you something, if it's not a level of sacrifice, what does it really mean? Right? Because if you look at it, isn't that, if we're talking about Christ's love, isn't that exactly how we knew that he loved us? Isn't that exactly how he showed his life for us, his love for us? Most popular Bible verse in the world. What is it? John 3, 16, right? What's the, far, what's the first part of that verse? So God so loved the world that he gave, that he gave. And did he give something cheap? Did he give something that wasn't meaningful? Did he give something that he didn't consider it to be a cost? No, he gave his son the most valuable thing that he had. So when we are talking about how you love your spouse, I'm going to ask you, is there a tangible element of sacrifice there? There has to be a cost. You know, in my marriage, I know that there's things that Christina does for me and she does it and she hates it, but she does it anyways. And that's how I know she loves me, right? And I'm going to tell you guys, you know, we have to, we have to pay a price if you show somebody that you love them. And that we all know that Christ loved us and that, that we should show that love to our spouses. And it sounds great. Right? But there's this whole thing and this thing that we should kind of pick up on because what do we say we want to love like? We want to love the way that Christ loved. Right? So we want to say that like we're going to love the same way that he loved us and it's going to be sacrificially. It's going to cost me something and I'm going to be poured out for, for my spouse. But there's a lot of the things <laughs> that comes to mind and if we were honest because we're humans and we're selfish, the first thing that comes to mind is I don't know if they deserve that. Right? I'll do it when they do it. Right? I'm going to let them do it first and then I'll respond because I'm tired and I'm done and I'm all of this other stuff. But I'm going to ask you, is that the way that Christ loved us? You know, one of the most convicting verses is Romans 5.8. It says, but God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Can you imagine if Christ would have waited until we deserved it? Until it was warranted? until we shared interests and until we were going to be better children for him, right? And I, I'm going to be honest with you, if that was how Christ approached it, we would still be waiting because on our best day, we are never, ever, ever worth it, right? And a lot of the times I feel that in our marriages, sometimes, right, like you compare the two, well, like you fooled somebody into marrying you, okay? Okay. Because guess what? On your best day, you probably weren't a great spouse anyways because you were inherently like sinful and selfish and, and you were really kind of in it for you anyways, right? So if you were honest, the same way that we are completely undeserving of Christ's love, there's a little bit of us, if you had a little bit of self-awareness, that you probably don't really deserve your spouse's love either. If you really, really had a clear look at yourself, every single one of us, why? And I'm not saying this about one spouse, I'm saying this about both spouses, because both of us are imperfect people. Both of us are selfish people. We just fooled somebody into thinking that we were better than we really were. So, and I believe this is like kind of one of the areas we need help in our marriages, right? Because, you know, Christ's love for us is there all of the time. Christ's love for us is not performance-based. Christ's love is not like, oh, how much time did you, know, did you spend in the Word today? Did you pray today? Did you do that today? Oh, because of that, then I'm going to pour out love back. Christ's love was there for us whether or not we deserved it. Christ was there for us whether or not our performance was adequate. But a lot of the times, that is not how we look at our spouses. When we look at our spouses, it's very, very different, right? You know, if, if I don't feel like my spouse did what I needed, then I'm not going to give her what she needed. And that's the way that we're running our marriages. And it's crazy, right? Because I see that behavior in my kids where I'll talk to one of my kids and I'll be like, dude, why are you being so, such a punk to this other one? Right? And they say, well, I'm being a punk to him because he was a punk to me. And I said, and you being a punk to him, do you think that you're going to get better behavior out of him? So you're going to treat him poorly. 
hoping that that poor behavior will result in good behavior? You know? And we look at your kid, you say, wow, dude, you are a special level of you don't get it, right? Because if you want to be nice to somebody or if you want to get nice behavior from somebody, what should you do to them? Be nice. If you want to feel love from your spouse, what should you give them? Love. But a lot of the times we, we, we act like we're retards, right? And we give them the cold shoulder, hoping that they're going to respond with love. And then we get disappointed when it doesn't happen. And I love it because, you know, when we go back to think about how God loves us, right? God loves us even when we've had a bad day, even we've, when we've given him a little bit of an attitude, right? Even when it's not warranted. You know, I might be short with my kids. I might not feel like going to church. I might wake up late on a Sunday, you know, and he still loves me even through that. But a lot of the time, we won't love our wives through their husbands or wives through their shortcomings because Christ's love is not conditional. He loves us through it no matter what. And I challenge every single one of us that when we got married, we took our spouses from the altar of God and we promised to do the same. We promised to love them through it. And I feel that there are some marriages today that need just a little bit of that Christ-like unconditional love in them. You know, because we have to be honest with ourselves. Like, our works will never, ever be good enough, right? Our marriages will need grace to survive. And I'm going to tell you, it's going to need grace to survive on both parts. Like, today, you might be the one who's extending that grace, but I promise you tomorrow's going to be the day that you need it. That's always how it works, you know? There's one time in particular that I remember where I felt this grace, and it was, um, it was Christina and I got into an office. Oh, man, I forgot to clear this with you, Tina. Sorry. I don't, did she leave? Yes. yes. So um, there, <laughs> there was a time that Tina and I got into an argument, and I got a little bit hot, right? And I got a little bit angry. You know, Egyptian men, sometimes we got the, 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 the fiery blood inside of us, right? And I said something I didn't mean. I said something I, didn't, I, I shouldn't have said, and I said it out of anger. Um, and, and, you know, it was one of those comments where it kind of ended the argument, right? Just at that point, like, it was like the fatal blow, and it all just kind of went away, and it kind of fizzled out. Um, and the, the argument kind of blew over, but there was still a lot of tension between us. And, and as a guy who knew I did something I shouldn't have done, right, I just had this heavy shame just pressing down on my chest, right? And I remember later somewhere um, in that evening, we were driving somewhere, and we weren't talking about it. You kind of like just brushed it under the rug and kind of kept going. Um, and I remember she just, kind of, she just kind of looked at me. She said, hey, I forgive you about that. And I got choked up, right? And I, and I tried to kind of apologize, and, 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 but she just showed me so much grace, and, and I felt so loved because I knew I didn't deserve it. Right? And I am telling you that there's a lot of marriages in here that they can use that sort of grace. Right? But when we get wronged, we, we demand like, the proper apology, said the proper way in the right manner. We're going to go ahead and we're going to go through the eight steps of the sin on what, what you did and like, kind of why you did it. But sometimes it, it's the grace that wins. Um, because our marriages need grace, and grace never keeps score. And we have to, we have to remember that. Um, and I remember every, like, for example, you can imagine this, right? I remember every single time Christina was pregnant, she would crave seven-layer burritos from Taco Bell. And I hate Taco Bell with a passion, but, you know, whatever, right? Sacrifice. So we would, we would, I'd go through and I'd get her her stupid seven-layer burritos. But you can imagine um, how much time I spent in that Taco Bell drive through And you, can you imagine what would happen? She'd be like, hey, I really want a burrito. So when I go and I get her that burrito, and then, like, the next day, I'd be like, hey, remember yesterday when I got you that burrito? Well, today I really want a Big Mac, so it's your turn. Like, it sounds ridiculous when you say it, right? But we do that in our marriages, like, all the time, right? It's very, you scratch my back, I scratch yours, right? Like, I did the dishes, you bathed the kids, right? Like, I cooked, you, like, you put away all of the stuff, right? Like, I, I did the laundry, you folded and put it away, right? Or, you know, last week you had a girl's night out, so this weekend I'm having a boy's weekend, right? You bought a new outfit, so I'm going to buy a new TV, right? Like, it's all of this very applicable, you know, stuff, but... I'll tell you, that's the beautiful thing about grace is grace doesn't keep score at all, right? And one of the things I always love when I'm talking to younger couples, right, before they're getting married and stuff, and they say, oh, yeah, no, we're going to be 50-50. The second I hear 50-50, I know, like, dude, this is, this is bad. It's not going to work. Does any marriage work off of 50-50? Never. I always tell people it's 100-100, right? 
a hundred, a hundred. It's going to be a hundred, a hundred, right? Because what it really takes, it takes both people giving it a hundred percent, a hundred percent of the time. Now, your 100% effort might end up being 30% of the work one week, right? But your 100% effort that next week could be 90% of the work. And you don't know. And the last thing you ever want is somebody trying to keep track on what 50-50 looks like because my 50 looks a lot different than Christina's 50, right? And we have to be honest when it comes to that. It doesn't matter, you know, a lot of the times it doesn't even matter how your, how your spouse responds, to it, right? Because if you want to love the way that Christ loved, you just need to put, your, put it all out there sometimes, even if you're not even getting it back. Because a Christ-like marriage is one that's focused on the good of the other spouse and making that person whole and not your own. So that was the first thing. We have to, we've, got to, we've got to learn how to love like him, unconditionally, 100 100, giving it all that you've got, being willing to sacrifice to show them your love for them. The second thing, and I only have two, so that's good news. The second thing is if we want to have Christ's light shining in our marriages, we need to forgive how Christ forgives. And I'm going to tell you, the same way that Egyptians, sometimes we tend to have hot blood running inside of us, I've never met a culture that's better at keeping a grudge or keeping like non-forgiveness than an Egyptian. And that could be one of the problems why we don't do marriage very well. You know, one of the Bible stories that always gets me is um, when St. Peter asks Christ, how many times should I forgive my brother? And Christ tells him 70 times 7. And I think that, like, you know, we lose that sometimes because 70 times 7 to us doesn't seem like a very big number, right? We, it's 490. And to be honest, if it was really 490, every single man in here would be single, right? Because our wives would have been done with us a long time ago. Um, but the, the problem is, is what, what he actually meant by that is there's no, there's no level. You just keep forgiving 100% of the time. Don't even keep track. 70 times seven. Seven being the perfect number. You multiply it. It was just, for them, it was a huge number. And all that we know is that in forgiveness, it's something that's really, really tough in marriage. And marriage is one of those places where we can be wronged far greater than any other relationship. So the cuts and the wounds that will come from a marital relationship are deep. And, we, and I, I acknowledge that. I don't downplay that. I know that that's real. Almost unforgivable stuff. But according to what we're taught and what we know is true, nothing's unforgivable. There are some things that may not be reconcilable, but there's no such thing as unforgivable. And if you're honest with yourself and you need more forgiveness than you, and if you're honest with yourself, you'll be the first one that knows that I need more forgiveness than I deserve. A lot of the times we think it's our spouse that needs all the forgiveness and they don't deserve it. But I'm going to tell you, this journey starts looking right in the mirror and you have to decide do I need more forgiveness than I deserve? And that answer should be yes. Because we're all sinners and we all have to realize that we did not get the short end of the stick in our relationships. We are bringing the short end of the stick into the marriage. So let me be clear. And I think this is a misconception. Is that we all need to forgive, but that does not mean that we turn a blind eye and we do not sweep things under the rug. Because forgiveness is not forgetness. It's a, it's a, a willingness to forgive an offense. Not just forget it like it never even happened. Not ignoring it like it's not currently happening. Because, you know, many times forgiveness is the act that will start the process of getting two people on the same page. And there's nothing that breaks my heart more when I see a marriage that's been so divided that they are completely, completely divided. And all of it because there's lack of forgiveness. You look at these people who are living separate lives in the same house right? Breaking up the family, the kids see it, everybody sees it. And the whole reason is because there's a lack of forgiveness. And many people are reluctant to show mercy because they don't understand the difference between trust and forgiveness. Forgiveness is letting the past go, okay? It's a prior offense that happened. You have to let that go. Trust has to do with future behavior. Forgiveness should be immediate. When someone sins against you, you should be able to forgive them whether or not that person asks. But trust must be rebuilt over time. Trust requires a track record. It's almost like a credit report, right? Like you can trust someone based off of their behaviors. You can lose trust for someone based off of their behaviors. And then if they have lost trust in the past and they start having good behavior again, kind of like a credit report, you can rebuild that credit score the same way that you can rebuild that trust. And if someone hurts you repeatedly, then you are commanded by God to forgive them but you are not expected to trust them immediately. 
And you're not expected to continue trusting them so they can just continue to hurt you. And the hardest part of that is actually letting go of the offense. Many spouses will forgive them, but they will not give up that trump card. And that is like poison for a marriage. You know, you could be in the middle of an argument that's completely unrelated. And what does the spouse say? Well, don't you remember that one time you? That's not a, that's not a person who's forgiven. They're still harboring all of that. And I'm going to tell you the reason I want to talk about that is the fact because we said that we want to forgive the way that Christ forgives. And it goes against everything that the Bible tells us about the way that God deals with us, right? Isaiah 118, it says, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your, skin, your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be white as uh, wool. Isaiah 43, 25. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will remember not your sins. Hebrews 10, 17. For their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. And I get that forgiveness is hard. And I get that in our marriages, it's a horrible place to be hurt. And, the, and it runs deep. And I'm not saying that stuff didn't happen. But what I'm asking for you guys is if you have some hurts like that, that you're still holding on to, that you need to take it to prayer and you need to ask God that he can teach you how to forgive that, right? Because the ability to hold those things over your spouses will prevent you from having a thriving marriage. And it's not worth the cost. You have to be able to move past that and to hopefully start on a path of reconciliation. It doesn't go away in like in a day or a moment or even a week at times, but you have to start the path of re reconciliation. Um, I heard this on the radio the other day and it really kind of freaked me out a little bit. It says, you know, do you know who the loneliest people are? You would think that the loneliest people are single people, right? Even chalk it up, said maybe someone who's older and single. That person got if you're really, really alone, right? But they did this study and they actually said the loneliest people are married people who are disconnected from their spouses, emotionally disconnected from their spouses. They said nothing is lonelier than laying next to somebody in bed and knowing that that person doesn't want you. And I'm going to tell you that that's one decision at a time. No one signed up for that. It was one decision at a time that got them there. But we don't need to stay there because God has a plan. He has a way. He wants to help us through these relationships. Like our marriages are a light to the gospel. They are a window to the gospel the same way that God came and he married the church. So he has a plan for reconciliation for that. And part of that plan is just more light more light, more Christ, more Christ's characteristics, more Christ's interaction. And I love this because no matter how bad your marriage can be, no matter how long it's been bad as well, one of my favorite verses, and I pray this over marriages all of the time, especially when we're going through hard times, is Joel 2.25. It says, I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. And what God is basically saying is not only will I fix your marriage, not only will I give you that marriage that you're looking for that's going to mirror the gospel, I will restore all of the lost years. I will make it better than it ever was. And it's such a beautiful promise because God is for marriage. If you ever want to see God's hand work somewhere, align it with something that is clear in his book what he's passionate about. And he's passionate about restoring marriages. And I just want to remind you guys in my closing that God does not love us because we are worth it. We'll never be worth it. On our best day, we will never, ever be worth it, right? And chances are that's, that, that might be how we feel about our spouses too, that they're not worth it. But the same way that God saw enough in us to make it work, it's the same way that we have to extend out Christ's love as well, right? He does not love us on the condition that we perform our deeds or that our words are perfect and we recite it the same exact way that he wants. He knows that we step out of a line. He knows that he makes mistakes. He knows that, we, that he understands and he loves us unconditionally. Forgiving us when we do have our shortcomings. Pulling us close to him. Always trying to reconcile us. Laying down his life for us. Giving all. How do we not mirror that? How do you not mirror that? So all I ask is that we just try to be a little bit more like him, right? 
the same way that I kind of wrapped up last week with the, with the story about Elijah being scared in the dark. What was the solution? Just turn up the dimmer just a little bit. And I know for some of you guys, maybe the marriages are fractured and they're broken and maybe they're bad. And I'm not, I'm telling you, you know what? Maybe just turn up the light a little bit. You know, start, start to thaw out a little bit. And my, and my takeaways, um, have an honest, and this, this, this doesn't go for just broken marriages, right? I think that this is extremely healthy for every marriage, even the marriages that are going great, right? Have an honest, transparent, and truthful talk with your spouse. Check in and see how things are going. Are their needs being met, right? Is there anything that they'd like to see from you? Is there anything that you can do as a spouse to make, to make things a little bit better, right? Tell them you love them. Not only tell them you love them, but kind of like I already said, you know what a great question to ask is, ask them, what's a good way for you to feel that I love you? Dial in on the actions, right? Also, if there's points of tension, forgive them, lay it down, no more holding grudges. And then I think that when we start seeing that, you will start seeing light showing up in our marriage. And I pray for transformation. I want this church to have so many on-fire marriage husbands and wives that passionately love each other, that when you walk into this crowded church, that it just shows. Amen? Amen. All right, stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you because you are such a good God, Lord. You, pl- you laid out such a perfect plan for us, Lord. And there's nothing that you are asking us to do that you yourself did not model for us. So, Lord, especially when it comes to the sensitive topic of our marriages, Lord, some of the hardships that we, that we walk through, Lord. This is probably one of the most difficult relationships in our lives to navigate. This is exactly where we need your light the most. So Lord, I ask that you shine. Lord, we, I ask that you, shine, that you shine for the sake of our families, Lord, for the sakes of our children. For Lord, we know that what you want for them, Lord, and our shortcomings sometimes prevents that. But I ask that you just give us the wisdom, the ability, Lord, um, the desire, to thrive in our marriages, Lord, so that we can have the type of home that you are looking for, Lord, to grow up your children in. So, Lord, I ask that you wrestle with hearts that right now, every single one of us, Lord, if there's anything in there that needs to be reconciled, if there's anything that we need to ask for forgiveness for from our spouses, Lord, if there's any forgiveness that we need to extend, Lord, I ask that you just bring that to the surface, Lord. I ask that you fill us with grace. I ask that you just allow us to have these conversations, Lord, to get on the same page. And we are, I pray for reconciliation for anyone who's, who's not reconciled, Lord. I, I pray for wisdom, for courage, Lord, for obedience. And I pray all these things in your holy and pre- blessed name, Lord. I ask that you have mercy on me, Lord, that you have mercy on this group, that you forgive us our sins, that you, pr- that you hear our prayers lifted in the session of our saints from our tears. Here, so we pray one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done.